Chapter 4 focuses on information security, which is a very relevant topic considering all the news that we hear uh, just about every day of some new security breach. Some key terms when we talk about information security, first off is the threat. What is the actual activity or event that poses potential harm to you or your organization? But then there's the concept of exposure. Yes, there's a threat out there, but how likely is it that that threat will be directed at you? Is your business a type of business that is likely to get attacked? Or is it uh, off the mainstream, unlikely to be the target of one of these attacks? And then of course, assuming that you do get attacked, how vulnerable are you? Do you have robust procedures in place to protect your system, your company, your personal information. Some of the factors that are really affecting the vulnerability is that we live in a world where everything is interconnected through wireless technology, the Internet of Things. With so many devices connected to our business and personal networks, each of those devices represents a potential vulnerability and entry point for a hacker or malicious software to get in. And so there are so many now, you know, the analogy you could make, it's, you know, it's a building with thousands of doors and windows. Each one of them has to be locked and protected because they would give someone access to the entire building. Computers and devices have gotten smaller and cheaper as we saw last week with the cameras. It's just, it's so difficult now because anyone can have an extremely powerful tool for trying to break into your, your company or your personal information that doesn't have to cost a lot. Along with that, it has become much easier to be a hacker. In the early days, to be a hacker, you really had to be a computer nerd, know all this kind of code to write it, to try and break into things. That's not true today. You can go out on the internet and find all kinds of free resources that give you the tools to start hacking. And then lastly on this, organized crime has recognized this as a much better way of stealing money than robbing banks and selling drugs where you have the potential of getting caught and going to jail. The real challenge here is that it is very difficult to prosecute cyber crimes and so the criminals can operate basically without any fear of consequence. Lastly, management support. If an organization does not have senior management that understands how difficult it is, then that creates a real problem. Now, who are the most dangerous employees? Certainly employees, that's one way that criminals can break into your system is through one of your employees. So who are the most dangerous employees? human resources and your information systems group. And the reason that they're considered the most dangerous is because they have access to all the information in the company, all the sensitive information. So if one of those provides a breach, it can be really uh, damaging to your organization. But there are some other people within your business or organization that can present real vulnerabilities. One is consultants. You bring in an outside consultant and oftentimes you give that consultant access to all of your key and sensitive information because you want their help. The challenge is, have you really vetted that consultant? Have you made sure that they're on the up and up, that they don't have some uh, nefarious intentions with your organization? But then there's two other groups that are also of real concern. One is security and the other is maintenance. And the reason that these groups of employees are so potentially dangerous is that they get to go anywhere, anytime in your organization and no one thinks anything about it. If you see a security person 
meandering through the CEO's office, you wouldn't think twice about it. Likewise, if you saw someone in there emptying the trash in the CEO's office, that seems totally normal. So they're able to go everywhere within your organization and no one pays any attention to them. And here's the challenge. Who are some of the most lowest, some of the most, uh, gee, I can't uh, speak proper English. Who are some of the least compensated employees in your organization? The maintenance people and the security people. They are not highly paid, so they have the potential to be tempted for financial gain. Some outside organization might approach a maintenance person or security person and say, how would you like to make $50,000? Well, here's what I need. But probably the biggest vulnerability we have is just human mistakes. People make mistakes. We had a case here in Oregon where a surgeon up at OHSU incorrectly put some uh, patient medical records on his laptop and then left his laptop in the back seat of his car and it was stolen. So that happened back in March of 2013 and 4,000 patients had their personal information exposed because of that mistake by that doctor. USB drives. USB drives are great. It's a great way to transmit information, but it's really easy to drop them, lose them. Most terms, I will find one or more USB drives left in the computer up at the lectern, and we'll talk more about this in class. But it doesn't have to be high tech. Paper documents. We had a case here where someone was took work home. They were working on things. They went to a restaurant, had a cup of coffee, and left a stack of employee papers and documents that had all their information, social security numbers, address, birthday, all that information. Fortunately, the manager of the restaurant saw it, set it aside, recognized that that was uh, potentially damaging information. And of course, I think you all should be aware of the problem about opening questionable emails. And we'll actually go through another example in class on that. Careless internet surfing. You know, if you go to the wrong site, you can get infected with malware. And so the question is, what are the most dangerous websites to go to? Most people will say the first thing that comes to their mind is a dangerous website you wouldn't want to go to is a porn site. Well, actually, it's a bad site to go to for other reasons, not just vulnerability, but for moral and ethical reasons. But the most dangerous website are actually blogs and web communications. They estimate that over 20% of blog sites have been infected with uh, malicious malware such as viruses. Here's the full list. You can see they're listed there. And yes, sure enough, down at the bottom is porn. But notice two other ones. Business and economy websites and education and reference websites. Those are websites that a lot of people need to go to all the time. And yet they have been um, infected with a lot of malware and so we'll talk about that in class as to how do you protect yourself you need to go to education and reference websites you want to research the business what's going on in the business world and the economy so how do you do it safely another mistake that people make is just poor password selection any guesses what the number one most commonly used password was in 2017. Well, here they come. There it is. One, two, three, four, five, six. Number one, and it has been for years. How stupid can you be to use that? If any of you have any of these passwords that you use on your accounts, you need to change them right away. So what does a, a good password look like? We'll talk about that in class. What is called a strong password?
Now another vulnerability that organizations have is this concept of social engineering. And this is where the bad person gets access to a business or to your personal information by tricking you into voluntarily letting them have access to it. For example, one way is called tailgating. And this is where I don't have a pass to get into a building. You know, I can't get through the electronic door. So I stand around outside the door with my cell phone up to my ears if I'm having a conversation. Someone comes, they swipe their card, they open the door, and then I put the cell phone down, and as they're walking through the door, I just grab a hold of the door and follow them right in, as if I was supposed to be there. Another danger is, uh, this applies to people who travel a lot, is the person next to you might be able to see what's on your screen and to get some valuable information. If you're ever concerned about that, they do make uh, screen filters you can put on your laptop to where if you have to be looking at the screen virtually straight on, if you're off to the side at all, you can't see anything. And we're going to talk about in class Kevin Mitnick, who was dubbed the king of social engineering. We'll look at it, even though it's a little bit older video. Look at the techniques he used, because the techniques he used are so valid today. The type of threats that we have, certainly espionage or intentional trespassing, information extortion. There have been companies that have been broken in. Uh, this, there was a lot that happened last year with hospitals and medical organizations and the, the people that broke in said, we have your information hostage. If you ever want the information back, you need to pay us this amount of money. Some of the ways that people get access to that information can be by stealing devices like the laptop that was stolen from the doctor. It can be breaking in and copying files or even what the term dumpster diving. Look at the stuff you throw out. Find documents or pieces of hardware, old hard drives that you find useful information on. Compromises to intellectual property. This can be your company's proprietary process, the, the recipe that they use to make the product. Things like sales figures. If I know my competitors' sales figures and what they predict for next year, that helps me develop a strategy as to how to outmaneuver them. Maybe I see that they're projecting a real large sales growth in the Midwest. And gee, I wasn't thinking the Midwest was going to grow. So now I start looking at that to see why would they think the Midwest territory is going to grow so much. Identity theft, and we'll talk more about this in class, is a huge issue for us as individuals. But it can also cause a lot of damage to businesses because businesses oftentimes are the ones that get stuck with the cost. So when someone steals your identity and makes an erroneous charge on your credit card and you dispute it with the bank, you end up getting credited so you don't have to pay for it, but neither does the bank. The bank then goes back to the merchant and vendor and says this was an unauthorized account and it's the merchant that bears the cost of this. So as a business, when someone's identity is stolen, you may end up paying the bill for that. So some of the deliberate threats that we have, again, software attacks. This can be a, you know, most common, a virus. Trojan horse, the idea of a Trojan horse is it looks like it's a legitimate program, a legitimate device that's coming in, but hidden within it is something malicious. Backdoor is the concept that when this malicious software is installed, it creates a backdoor to where someone can get in without needing any credentials. 
So it's creating a new entry point into your system that you're not aware of and it has no security on it. A logic bomb, when you hear that term, what that means is that it's installed on your computer and it does nothing. It just sits there until a specific date or time occurs or a specific event occurs. You could have a logic bomb that says when the stock market reaches this certain amount, execute this. When a certain code is sent to the computer, execute this. Phishing is the concept that I'm going to contact you with what appears to be a legitimate request for information and I'm asking you to provide some personal information back. It's kind of a way of social engineering but through electronic means where I'm tricking you into actually telling me significant information like your bank account, your login password, uh, we'll, as I said, we'll look at another example of a phishing email in class. Distributed denial of service, or referred to as DDoS attacks. This is where software has been installed on your computer unbeknownst to you. It's kind of the category of the logic bomb. And it sits there doing nothing until it gets a wake-up signal transmitted to it. And when it gets that wake-up signal, it then performs a single function, and that's to send a request for information to a specific website. And when you have 200,000 computers scattered all around the United States, all of a sudden being woken up by the command that's sent out by the bad guys, and it says, contact JCPenney's website with a request. All 200,000 of them do it at the same time to the same website. Websites cannot handle you know, that kind of traffic. Websites are designed to handle certain levels of traffic. And when you swamp them with 10, 100, 1,000 times the normal number of requests, it causes the website to crash and go down. And so that's why it's called a denial of service. You are effectively preventing that company's website from functioning. And it's called distributed because it's not just one person attacking the system. It's hundreds of thousands of unwitting computers around the country. You know, you wonder why, gee, how come sometimes my computer runs really slow for a few minutes and then gets back to being normal? Well, one way is that uh, it's Windows is doing a security update and it slows things down. But another reason might be that you have this uh, bot, what's called bot software installed on your computer and periodically it wakes up and does something and then it uh, goes back to sleep for a while. Another attack, the SCADA attacks. This is where you use the electronic connection between our computer network systems and the real world to affect a real world attack. So you're not trying to attack the digital information, you're trying to use the internet and company networks to do some physical harm. For example, back in 2003, there was a failure in the northeast to the power grid. Now it was not a SCADA attack, it was just an actual a malfunction on one particular part of the power grid that caused a domino effect. The end result was, as shown there, 9,300 square miles, 50 million people without power. And it took several days to fix this problem. Now, in reality, that could have been a SCADA attack. If, if they were able to penetrate to the control systems of the power grid, someone could initiate, in essence, the same thing. 
if our power grid is attacked, it could wipe out, you know, power to millions and millions of people. Going on with that is the concept of cyber warfare. When you use an electronic attack to affect someone else, another country, either their electronic systems or their physical systems, that's cyber warfare. And actually in class we'll look at what is kind of recognized as the first cyber warfare attack. And as I show there on the screen, it was when the uranium enrichment program in Iran was sabotaged via software. You'll hear the term alien software. All alien software means it's software that is installed on your computer without your knowledge or intent. For example, spyware, key loggers, spamware, cookies. And a lot of times cookies are installed and you don't realize it. Now there's been a lot in the news in the past year about cookies and a lot of companies have been notifying you about their use of cookies and installation of cookies. Cookies sometimes are a good thing. It makes browsing and interacting with companies easier, but it can be a bad thing as well. And so you may want to periodically in your organization or your personal computers, take care of the cookies, wipe them all out and start over to make sure you don't have any in there that you really don't want. Okay, so let's talk about risk for a moment. Risk management. This is just the concept of acknowledging that there is risk out there. We can't eliminate risk. You know, we can't be hermits and go up in the hills and be uh, completely removed from society. We're part of society, and so there's going to be risk of bad guys trying to do something. But we want to manage that risk to an acceptable level first way to do that is we do the analysis. What is the risk? For example, as a homeowner, I have the risk that someone will want to break into my house and steal some of my property. So I analyze that's a risk that could happen. With risk mitigation, we're looking at first we accept that there's a certain amount of risk that we can't eliminate. There is risk there. We've done everything we can to limit it. And then at the end, we say, is there anything I can do to lessen the impact if, if this were to happen by transferring some of the risk to someone else? The most obvious example of that is car insurance or homeowners insurance. We're saying there, we don't plan to have an auto accident. But in case we do have an auto accident, we don't have to bear the full cost of that accident. Some of that cost will be borne by the insurance company and we'll just have to pay our deductible. That's an example where we have transferred some of the risk to another company, typically an insurance company. So let's talk a, few, a little bit about ways that we can prevent or limit the risk happening to ourselves personally or to our organization. Obviously physical controls, doors, gates, that's why we have locks on our houses, that's why businesses have areas where you have to have uh, keys or key cards in order to gain access. We can use things like biometrics and passwords to authenticate the, the individual that, yes, they should have access to this information. Within our network, we can have data flow restrictors that says this particular group should not be able to, I don't care you know, what uh, route they use, they should not have access to data coming from finance. So you can have within the network some checks and balances built in there that will say, no, this is not uh, a valid um, access to that information. So authentication, let's talk a little more in detail about that. One idea, one aspect of authentication is something the user is. 
So let's look here at some other slides. This is where we get into biometrics. This is something unique about the individual. Facial recognition has gotten very sophisticated. My laptop, when I turn it on, the camera on my laptop looks and says, oh, hi, I see you, and it logs me into Windows without me having to type my password because it's using facial recognition software. Another interesting one is the hand geometry. If you see there with the pins, it determines where the joints are on your hand. Just the shape of your hand is unique. And there it is scanned not just your fingerprints, but your palm print, you know, all aspects of your hand to be able to say, yes, this is really the person who is allowed to come in. And of course, we're all familiar with fingerprints. But this one I thought is intriguing, a palm scan. Now you notice the person is hovering their hand over the device. And what it's actually doing is it's scanning the blood vessels in your hand. If you can see down at the bottom, that's the infrared image. And from looking at that infrared image, then it comes over and determines where are the blood vessels, the veins in the hand. And by that, again, is a unique signature that it's your hand. I think we've all seen in the movies the scans of the eye, you know, that our retinal, um, our retinas in our eyes are unique, and so you can scan that. This one is an intriguing one as well. The way that you walk is unique to you, and so if you record someone walking at a, you know, to, from uh, you know left to right across in front of the cameras, it can determine what is your gait. You know, how does your body move when you walk? And then as long as you try and replicate that going forward for the next time, trying to walk at the same pace and speed and assuming you haven't injured your leg in the meantime, it's actually a very unique way it can analyze and say, yes, that is really you just based on how you walk. Okay, let's get back to the main show. Another way of authentic someone is by something that that the user has, you know, a uh, here a, a driver's license. This is an old-fashioned license, very easy to duplicate. So not really good way of doing it. A better way is the newer cards have chips built into them, just like our credit cards. That makes it a smart ID card. This is a token, and it generates a random six-digit number. And so when you have that token with you, then when you're going to a website or something else, you have to have that six-digit code, and it's uniquely keyed to your login. So you have to know the login you're trying to use to get onto the website, and you have to have this unique code generator with you. I'll show you uh, in class. I have one of these for my Wells Fargo accounts. Proximity readers, probably everyone's familiar with those. This is where you have your employee badge and you just get within close proximity. You don't usually have to swipe anymore. You just have to kind of tap it and it will recognize that uh, you have a correct card. It hasn't you know, this doesn't uh, prevent someone who shouldn't have the card from using the card is the challenge because it doesn't know who has it, just that someone has a legitimate valid card. Something that the person does also, signature recognition. You know, we do have unique ways of writing. And so it can be very, 
precise in identifying is this really the person now, of course there are forgers who get very good at it interesting one is speech recognition now, this is where you record a given sentence that uh, then when you repeat it back it will analyze the speech pattern that is on file versus as you're talking now and determines the same person when I call into my brokerage account they have speech recognition software on file for me and so probably nine times out of ten when I call in they don't ask for any further identification because they have done the analysis and it says yes I am really who I uh, say I am and I'm calling from a phone number that is associated with my account occasionally they do ask me for some additional information because something in the way that I stated my name it didn't uh, you know didn't recognize just correctly but uh, it's actually pretty good most of the time then there is something that the person knows obviously passwords is one pass phrases is even better strong passwords we'll talk more about this in the class but ideally you don't reuse passwords so m most of the places where you have a password it should be unique just to that it shouldn't have any personal information in it minimum eight characters longer is better and it should have a variety of different things in it upper lower case special characters numbers and as I indicated we'll look at a tool in class that can analyze your passwords and tell you how strong they are the password for this week's chapter 4 quiz is copyright make sure you write it down you'll need it to access the quiz the bad guys started using computers to try and randomly log into people's accounts and generating passwords and login names just at random and seeing if they could get in one of the ways to prevent that from happening is through the concept of captcha and that's where it displays something that a computer can't analyze but a human being can and then ask you to enter that information in this was the early implementations of captcha had things like this where you'd have to type in the letters more recently uh, what they're using is things like click on all the boxes that contain a picture of a car those are very difficult things for a computer to do on its own and so it helps in, to ensure that the that it's actually a person that is trying to log in not a computer okay let's talk for a minute about firewalls firewall came about from things like the great fire in London where you had all these wooden buildings built right next to each other and if one caught fire it went to the next to the next to the next to the next there was nothing to stop it and so then they started putting brick walls between each building because the brick wall would stop the fire uh, or at least slow it down keep the heat from getting to the next one in time so that they could uh, put out the fire and keep it from spreading so it's the same concept what we want to do is prevent the movement you know just like a firewall was trying to prevent the movement of fire we want to prevent the movement of malicious data unauthorized people from one point to another so we want to protect our servers both external threats and attacks as well as internal uh, attacks from employees so some of the ways we do that anti malware systems we can whitelist and blacklist the concept here is that nobody gets through this firewall unless they're on the approved list 
blacklisting is the idea that says if you're on this list you cannot get through the firewall data encryption of course that is, the concept there is even if you get access to the data it's encrypted so it's meaningless to you we can use virtual private networks to ensure that the information is flowing not between the outside world but only between the two parties involved and some of the ways that the internet has evolved over time and we'll see this in the later chapters we look at the history of the internet is this concept of a secure socket layer you hear this talked about as SSL and another way of maintaining a firewall and things don't happen internally that shouldn't happen is by monitoring your employees this is the situation where the network administrator can see whatever it is you're doing as we talked about in a previous class about the ethics about should the company be monitoring and if they found employees you know, going to websites um, you know for personal use is it okay to punish employees and so forth but this is a really important thing that all large companies do is to periodically check on monitor to make sure employees are not doing something they shouldn't be doing on company time with company equipment so at the top here is a basic home firewall system you see the ISP is connected to the internet and you've got your home PC there's nothing to protect you along the way up here except this software firewall installed on your computer it's important you have a firewall installed on your computer now some of the routers that are being provided now that allow you to connect your PC to the internet are now coming with some hardware firewall built into them the more expensive ones have that but it's really important you have the appropriate software installed on your PC and I've listed in the course some very low cost options for making sure you have adequate firewall protection when we get to the corporate version down below it's more robust we've got hardware firewalls here hardware firewalls here as well as software firewalls we really want to protect these servers to make sure that no one is tapping into those servers that isn't supposed to a term you'll hear talked about is public key encryption and so I'll just give you really briefly the way this works the concept is that you have both a public and a private key so in this case Bob has taken his public key and he's given it to Alice Carol and David but he keeps his private key to himself he doesn't share that with anyone Alice wants to send a document to Bob securely so she uses Bob's public key that he gave to her and it encrypts this information sends it to Bob Bob then uses his private key that he has not shared with anyone to decrypt it and so now he gets the information that was sent so it's got two different keys one that is shared and one that is kept private to you VPN works on this concept that my organization and I have another group over here this can be a remote employee or a vendor and we want to have an interconnection with each other that uses the internet to get there but it's created this tunnel that goes through the internet that only we have access to it no one outside here in the internet can tap into this data flow there's some complex hardware and software required to do that but a lot of organizations have VPN networks and tunneling set up to establish this communication so like I say especially with remote employees and key vendors but we have to plan for the worst case what happens if our system gets breached or what happens if we have a fire in our computer room 
you know, are all our data and records, are they lost? So one of the ways of doing that is to have a hot site. And a hot site is an, a mirror image of all of our servers. It is exactly duplicated and replicated, but somewhere else, located physically somewhere else. So in the event that something goes wrong with our system, we can flip over to the other site immediately and pick up right where we left off. We have all the same data and information. Obviously, that's an expensive solution. What's more likely is to have what is a warm site. A warm site is one that periodically you're updating the information, synchronizing it, and so you can bring it up quickly. It may not have the latest, but it's going to be close. Cold site is more refers to these are the backup tapes, disks. They're sent to some off-site storage someplace. And in the event that you have to uh, recover from a disaster, it's going to take time. You're going to have to rebuild your servers, then reload all the software back on. You know, it can take days to reconstruct your system. It's the least expensive, but obviously in the case that you have to use it, it keeps your business shut down for the longest period of time. One of the keys if you're going to have a disaster recovery is you need to have that backup information located in geographically dispersed locations. You don't want an earthquake in San Francisco to wipe out both your main office and your backup site that was located in San Jose, which is just down the, the road from San Francisco. You want your backup maybe to be in the Midwest. Maybe you want to have a third backup that's on the East Coast. What's the likelihood of having three different locations all go down at the same time? A client that I worked for, we set up a system with them using an outside vendor that had three locations for their servers. And these were, were hot site servers. And so the the website that we had hosted there, if the, the main site went down, they could flip instantly to one of the other two sites. And so our site would never go down for more than a second or two. They were located in the Midwest, the uh, Southeast, and the Southwest. So pretty dispersed. The one thing that our vendor didn't think about was a disgruntled employee. And they had an employee that they were about to fire. The employee realized that he was going to get fired. And so he wrote a malicious script that he initiated. When he walked out the door, he started it. And that script went out to all three sites and told all three sites to erase everything. So even though they had thought in advance about geographical issues and making sure they had multiple backups, they forgot about a disgruntled employee could destroy all of them. It took, I think our website was down for three weeks while they tried to figure out how to get things back up and going. And that's it for chapter four. As I mentioned, we'll talk more about this in class and I'll show you some specific examples.